Well, hello everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this first Motor Neurone Disease Academy webinar. My name is Diga Hastis and I'm the head of the Parkinson's Academy and a chair this afternoon. Before we start, I would like to thank our sponsor Zambon in supporting the learning this afternoon. So, without any further delay, let me hand you over to Nick to start this afternoon's session. Nick, over to you. Thank you. Um, so, a pleasure to be invited to speak today. And um, as uh, mentioned in the introduction, I'll just give you a brief introduction to what motor neuron disease is and talk through some of the uh, things that are happening in research at the moment. There's a myriad of things, probably too many to to mention in this session, but happy to answer any questions at the end. And also if anyone would like to contact myself or other members of my team afterwards, uh, be delighted. So um, what is motor neuron disease? So motor neuron disease is a fatal rapidly progressing disease that affects the brain and spinal cord. And it's the motor neurons in the brain and spinal cord uh, that are affected. So it's progressive neurological disease and people with motor neuron disease will eventually become unable to move, talk, swallow, and breathe. And it's also very unpredictable in its progression. It can be either very rapid. There are also instances of pauses in progression or even a slight improvement for a, for a short period of time. And currently there's no cure um, and only really some therapies that can potentially slow the disease for a very short period of time. So ultimately MND kills a third of people um, within a year and more than half within two years of diagnosis. So it's really something that, um, you know, we're striving to, to find the answers to and to do something about. So what is MND? So MND is really an umbrella term. There's um, uh, a kind of branding issue, I guess you could say, because it's known as ALS in the USA, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So there are various forms of MND. MND stands for motor neuron disease. So ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, progressive bulbar palsy, progressive muscular atrophy, and primary lateral sclerosis. And these are the medical terms, and, and these are given to different forms of MND. The main uh, form is ALS, which represents over 80% of motor neuron diseases. And uh, the others are a much smaller proportion. And the names really come from where anatomically the disease starts um, and some of the symptoms. And you can see this on the next slide, which shows um, which regions really that the, the progression begins in different people and how that, how that naming is, is given to that umbrella term of motor neuron disease. So you'll hear those terms really, but mo mainly what I'll be talking about today is ALS, but it's also very applicable to those other forms of MND. Okay, so also when people have motor neuron disease, around 35% of people experience mild cognitive change, which causes difficulties with planning, decision-making and languages, and a further 15% experience uh, signs of frontotemporal dementia, which uh, has a much more pronounced behavioral change. And it was only really in the last 10 years or so that this has really been recognized scientifically, which is which is quite surprising maybe, but it's also a relief to people um, who, who have known people with motor neuron disease because it explains some of their potential change in behavior. And often this change in behavior happens before symptoms occur. So um, that's something that's being worked on and some of the genes that are involved in frontotemporal dementia um, are also involved in motor neuron disease. And we'll perhaps touch on that a little later. So MND affects people from all communities. There's no, it doesn't discriminate. Um, it's mainly a disease of older people, but there are um, some quite young people who also have motor neuron disease as well, uh, but generally between the years of 50 and 60 years old. And your lifetime risk of motor neuron disease is about one in 300. So if you look at the death certificates of everybody, one in every 300 will um, have motor neuron disease uh, written on it as a cause of death. Six people are diagnosed with MND every day. And as the next slide will tell you, six people also die uh, from MND every day. So that's quite a large turnover, um, as I said, because of this short period of time that people actually uh, live with the disease and the rapid nature of its progression. Around about 10% of people with MD live for more than 10 years um, as well. So it should be noted, I'm sure you're all familiar with um, Stephen Hawking, who is an exception to the rule in terms of having motor neuron disease for over 50 years. 
So, so incidence um, of MND are in the population around about two people per 100,000 and the prevalence around seven per 100,000 in the UK. And it's the same prevalence in the USA um, and other Western countries as well um, that, that have uh, reported the numbers of uh, people with MND. So this really results in the fact that there are 5,000 adults living with, or 5,000 people living with MND at any one time in the UK. So that's a constantly revolving population of people being diagnosed uh, with the disease. So just a brief summary of the symptoms of MND, uh, muscle wasting and weakness, fasciculations, cramps, spasticity, respiratory problems, speech difficulties, swallowing difficulties, sleeping problems, due to breathing difficulties, um, problems with saliva and mucus because of a difficulty in swallowing, uh, weight loss from hypermetabolism and difficulties eating that occur with MND, fatigue, pain in the muscles, emotional problems, pseudo vulgar affect, which um, can mean that people can laugh or cry spontaneously um, without really wanting to do that. Um, and, that and that's something that um, occurs. And cognitive change, as I've mentioned, thinking, communication and behavior and emotional changes. And we'll just touch on some of these in a bit more detail in the next slide. So really, muscle atrophy wasting is that complete loss of movement. So you're losing those nerve cells that allow the muscle to contract. And that can affect breathing, swallowing, speech, uh, facial expression, posture. For example, being able to hold the head up, obviously standing up. So anything that involves muscles that um, are needed to do those movements. So there are some um, potential devices that can help with that, uh, not, not um, to improve it in, in or to, to stop it, obviously, but devices such as wheelchairs and um, head up collars, which can, can hold the person's head up. Uh, muscle twitching and rippling under the skin, breathlessness and trouble sleeping can be um, helped with um, NIV, non-invasive ventilation. So this is positive air pressure when a person's breathing, um, tracheostomy, and permanent ventilation, trouble swallowing, dysphagia, uh, modifying the diet, possibly gastrostomy, uh, which is a, a tube into the stomach for, for feeding. Um, excess uh, saliva can be treated with anticholinergic medication or even Botox into the salivary gl glands to reduce the amount of saliva that's produced. The hypermetabolism, which leads to weight loss again, modifying the diet, perhaps an increased calorie intake and gastrostomy uh, is also an option. Dysarthia, difficulty speaking, um, there are devices and aids for that, and also a person can bank their voice. The association has done some uh, great work on a, a book that a person can read, which captures the essential sentences that are required for the computer to then reconstruct your, your complete voice. Again, that emotional liability, um, there are some drugs that can be used to control that. Uh, New Dextra, I believe, is, is one of them. Um, and again, those cognitive and behavioral changes, really, it's more, more a case of understanding that, that that's happening in a person, um, which is which is beneficial um, because, you know, the person can feel quite embarrassed or upset about the fact that, that, that that's happening to them um, in an inopt opportunity or in an inopt moment. Uh, medication for pain for muscles, joints, cramps and stiffness. And again, other, other aspects that are not just physical, there's the mental side of uh, MND, loss of independence, feelings of isolation, um, and ways around that is support um, from, from um, uh, the system and also from uh, family members, et cetera. Um, and you know, it's important to realize that MND impacts the whole family and the whole network, children and young people are effective. And we, we put quite a few things in place to support different uh, groups of people affected by MND, including the person uh, with the disease. So important to remember all of those uh, people need to be included. So what's rarely affected in MND are the senses. So touch, taste, sight, smell, and hearing, bowel and bladder, sexual function, eye muscles, and heart. Um, so there are some things that, which are preserved in MND. Um, I mean, it's, it, there's an interesting question as to why that is the case. For example, the nerves that go to the eye muscles um, are some of the last uh, nerves to affect, affect muscles. And the reason why that happens scientifically, we don't understand yet, but it could be due to the size of those motor nerves that, um, that move those muscles. But uh, this is just to say that not everything is, is effective. So people 
you could say are effectively trapped, becoming trapped within their body. They can still um, think and and feel and um, have all those emotions, but be un unable to move uh, within within uh, their own bodies. So one of the really big problems with MND um, is diagnosis. A diagnosis is very much difficult to do. It's more a process of elimination of other uh, diseases which which could have similar symptoms to those that I mentioned before. And we know now that rapid and accurate diagnosis is really critical. The sooner somebody can get um, some medication, potentially treatments that are in the pipeline, um, the better the effects um, will be of those medications. You can think of the analogy of uh, perhaps a house burning down. If you try to go in and rescue the furniture um, after the fire has been through, then there's, then there's no um, hope really to rescue those things. So same with the motor neurons and with function, the sooner we can diagnose somebody, the sooner they can get access to any medicines that come along. Um, and ideally that will, that will minimize um, the effects of MND or even stop or slow it, uh, which is what we all want. So there's no real test, as I said, process of elimination. And we really need um, biomarkers to try and identify um, when people have the disease. If you think of a test for, of insulin for diabetes or a breath test for drink driving, if we had a test like that for MND, that would be great to, to diagnose people really early. In addition to that, in clinical trials, we'd also be able to monitor um, whether the drug was working by seeing the level of those biomarkers change. At the moment, the only way to really measure if a, if a drug is being effective is to measure the level of disability, which we have a scoring system called the ALS-FRS, ALS for ALS, MND, FRS for functional rating scale. And that's a score from zero to 48 of different classes, um, scoring zero to four combined together to give a score of 48, um, where 48 is normal function, zero is no function. Um, and we at the association have put together this red flag system to try and help GPs to, to really direct people to a neurologist as soon as possible uh, by looking at particular symptoms because this accumulation of different symptoms people can be sent all over the place before they get to see a neurologist. So there's just a few of those symptoms really. So it's to try and um, get the GP to, to see those things, combine them together, see if there's a progression um, in symptoms and perhaps consider motor neuron disease or a neurological condition um, in, the, in the coding that they do and when they see patients. Okay, so also um, there is a nice guideline um, which gives that guidance on the best way to look after people, to assess and manage them, best practice um, for people with motor neuron disease. And we have a, our expert group has reviewed the NICE guidelines from 2019 and detailed where changes are necessary. Um, and as a result, um, it's come NICE is conducting an extraordinary review. So we're working towards that. So this is, this is re really taking um, care and things away from the anecdotes and, and really looking at the evidence to see what, what is the best practice and the best way to look after people with MND and also to incorporate changes um, as things develop. For example, genetic testing um, is now uh, being, there's a, there's a need for that, which is gonna be incorporated, we hope, into the NICE guidelines. And one thing that we really know is that multidisciplinary care is actually the most effective um, way to improve survival and quality of life for people with MND. So um, this isn't this is really the ideal way to do things. It, it's not available for everybody due to location and other factors. But really, if people can can be looked after in one place, all the things that they need, um, dietitians, speech therapists, etc., then that's really the gold standard um, at the moment for looking after people with motor neuron disease. And that's something that we um, really focus and work hard on. And we've got twenty three care centres around the country where people can. Um, hopefully be looked after as, as best as possible with the condition with M D. So what treatments are available? So there are actually some treatments available. Now, none of this is perfect by any means. Most of the treatments that are available um, can slow the rate of progression by a relatively small amount. So we're a long way from an effective, a really effective treatment or a, or a cure, in fact, for MD. Um, you know, there's conversations about cumulative effects, combining all these medications together, but a lot of these uh, are very recent um, discoveries um, which have been approved. So in the UK at the moment, we, we have Riliazole, which has been around for a very long time, which is uh, works on the glutamate pathway, 
So it can't be tolerated by everybody. Um, and again, it's it, it's um, been shown to extend survival by several months in some people with MND and tends, evidence also suggests that it tends to increase survival in the later stages of the disease as well. So that again comes with its own um, uh, questions really in terms of, uh, of the value of that. But again, it's the, it's the standard uh, treatment for people with MND in the UK. Now we've got three other compounds really that have um, come to the fore very recently none of which are approved in the UK at the moment various reasons for that to do with licensing and and uh, looking at the evidence different countries have different um, different bars really higher bars for um, whether or not something will be improved or not so the first one is Adaravone uh, and then Albriosa AMX0035 or uh, Relivrio, it's called in the USA, and Tafersen, which is a very new um, gene therapy that's um, only just been approved by the FDA this year. And I'll talk to you about that in some detail um, towards the end of the presentation. So we're a long way from effective treatments, but this kind of indicates that there are things in the pipeline and that work is going on and discoveries are being made. So we really need to, to step this up to get more effective treatments. But uh, again, um, a lot of these things have been tested in further clinical trials. Some of them have had conditional approvals, which, which means that they can be used in some countries, but trials are ongoing to work out whether they really are effective and, and should be continued to be used. Okay, so I mentioned that MD kills a third of people with a year and half within two years of diagnosis, and that there's a, no effective cure or treatments. So that's not ideal. And so what are we doing about it? So look, so what we do at the association, and this happens in other places as well, but we care for people with MND, we campaign for the rights of people with MND um, and raise awareness for the disease and also research. So I'm going to touch upon the research now. So we uh, fund world-class research, trying to understand the disease, what's the biology behind the disease? Why is it that these motor neurons are dying or degenerating in MND and try to uncover uh, new treatments? And we leverage a lot of our funding, around a third of it is with other organizations to get the best value for money to do this research. And at the moment we have 113 different uh, grants ongoing. So we're funding a huge number of people, a huge number of projects, answering a huge number of questions. Uh, and this is going on all over the world. This is an image of the International Symposium on ALS MD that we organize. And we have about 1,800 delegates from 45 different countries pre COVID. Um, so, this is a real melting pot of, of all the brains on MD and ALS that are going to go back to their labs and their groups all around the world with the latest ideas, making sure everyone works together and collaborates to answer the question you know, why is MD happening to people and how can we uh, get tr effective treatments? Um, as quickly as possible. As I mentioned, uh, delegates from all over the world. So research is happening 24 uh, seven. When we go to bed in the UK, people are getting up in Australia and doing their research. So everyone's working towards uh, an answer and really trying to understand and find treatments for MND. And there really has been an explosion in, in new knowledge. So this is a graph which shows the number of publications about MND ALS, which is, which is really accelerating, increasing all the time. And, you know, there's never a good time for MND, but there's never been a better time than now. And this is all funded through donations and all the, all the uh, ways that people get money into fund research, which is really the only way we're going to understand the disease and find treatments. So one of the big um, or one of the only things we know about the cause of MND is um, gene changes. So people have changes in their genetics. So in some people, in some families, MD runs in the family. And that's been a hint that there is a genetic cause, potentially a genetic cause of MD for some time. Um, with the advent of um, technology and um, supercomputers and some incredible uh, scientists working out ways to Sequence genomes, we can now uh, sequence a genome in under 24 hours um, for less than $1,000. In 2000, the Human Genome Project cost about a billion dollars and took about 10, 15 years to do one, one genome. So very rapid advances in computers and technologies allowed us to discover the genes that are associated with MD. So there are many of these. MD is a very complicated disease, as is all neurological diseases, which is why it's been so difficult to find answers and we're still looking for all the answers for effective treatments. 
don't worry about the details of this graph, but it's just showing you the different gene names and the, and the rate of acceleration. The first one being a gene called SOD1, discovered in 1993, um, and then all the way up, uh, and ongoing discoveries happening all the time. And this is part of a, a project, international project, um, called Project Mine as well, which has uh, enabled us to find these genes. So what is it about um, motor neurons that's, that makes them vulnerable or affected in MD? So they're very long cells and they're like the electrical wires that connect um, our muscles. Uh, so when you want to move your little finger, for example, you're sending a signal uh, from your brain down these motor neurons to the muscles in your little finger, which allows them to contract. And that's an incredibly complex process, chemicals being turned to electricity and back again. And, and there are many ways in which that can potentially go wrong. And those motor neurons, which are which are pictured here, a schematic cartoon of a single motor neuron in, in, in red, um, can be very, very long. And we have them for the whole of our lives. Um, so they don't regenerate unlike other cells in our bodies. They're very long. If you imagine the cell body, which is where the nucleus is held as the size of a basketball, the length of a, a motor neuron from your spinal cord down to your little toe can be about the length the equivalent length of a, a, mo a running track 400 meters so it's a huge amount of maintenance to keep these things alive and, and surviving um we're coming towards the sciencey part now so um it's not it was originally thought it was just motor neurons hence the name motor neuron disease but actually we know that it's much more complicated than that so in the muscle on the right hand of this slide uh, there's an image of uh, neuromuscular junction so this is where the Neuromuscular junction is where the nerves anchor into the muscle and those contraction signals happen to allow the muscle fibers to contract. Those are very sensitive um, and many different processes that are ongoing in those structures. Um, at the other end, uh, within and around the cell body, there are now cells identified like microglia and astrocytes, which we know are absolutely vital to maintaining the motor neurons and removing infection. Uh, and when these processes go wrong, um, those, those cells can actually turn against the motor neurons uh, in, in, in inflammation and cause problems and remove the motor neurons or cause the motor neurons to die. And there are various uh, trials and drugs ongoing to try to uh, keep those cells, those microglial cells, in a, in a, a friendly state, as it were, to stop that um, immune response. And then there's all the shuttling of the products up and down the neuron. This is just a very simplified version. Uh, on the next slide, there's a fantastic um, image from a review by uh, Richard Mead and co-authors, uh, which shows you some of the genes that are involved in these different processes and some of these additional processes, which we won't go into great detail, but oxidative stress, excited toxicity, uh, vesicle transport dysregulation, protein homeostasis, DNA repair, a whole plethora of different um, things that we know go wrong in these particular cells in motor neuron disease and the genes that are associated with it. So given us real targets where to, where to really focus the research. The next slide is very similar, so we can skip over that one, but it's, um, it's showing those processes and, and some of the products that are um, in clinical trial for those mechanisms. So uh, not yet approved, some of them are, some of them aren't, but um, you know, real progress is being made to try and discover if we can, if we can correct some of those processes that have gone wrong uh, in MD. So we've really gone from knowing there's a problem to understanding the problem um, to really get to the point where we can now hopefully do something about it, which is which is really where where we've wanted to be for a long time. But um, I think now that we're in a really good place for that um, and that's true. And M&D has really attracted a lot of industry now. A lot of um, pharma companies can see that there's potential for effective treatments in M&D. So that's bringing in uh, funding and resources and these clinical trials are really taking off um, and, and um, hopefully discoveries are, are just around the corner. So let's move on to some um, of those discoveries and facts. So this is um, just an image of the clinical trials that are ongoing in the UK right now. So we have seven clinical trials. M&D Smart is testing three drugs. So that's a, an additional couple of drugs that have been tested. And we're really coming at M&D from all angles. So we've got genetic therapies that are targeting known genes and known proteins. Triumec, Lighthouse 2 trial, which is looking, which is using an antiviral medication called Triumec, which is actually a HIV medication to um, really go after a, a, a virus called HERV-K, which is an ancestral virus that we all have 
uh, bits of us in our DNA and is thought to be reactivated um, in motor neuron disease. A whole, a whole plethora, as I say, of different um, different uh, ways of targeting the disease, and hopefully one more or all of these will result in a positive outcome, uh, which would be fantastic. So. Uh, we've got lots of resources on our website if you want to know more about the specifics of each of these uh, compounds and clinical trials. But I'll touch on a couple of them as we go through now, just to finish to first, and which is the SOD1 uh, gene change and uh, FUS as well, which is the one on the bottom left, which is another gene which is changed in people with motor neuron disease. Um, to first, and the ATLAS trial, 2% of people with m and have an SOD1 gene change, and around about 1% of people with MD have an FUS FUS gene change. Um, so these treatments, if they work, won't work for everybody, but they will potentially work for a subset of people and provide really a proof of principle and, and knowledge that actually we can turn m and around um, and hopefully stop or, or reverse it. I just... Um, say again, we go back to that motor neuron, in that cell body, there's a nucleus and the nucleus is a bit like the control tower um, in an airport. And it has all of our uh, instructions to, to run the cell and to, to uh, maintain it. And it, within that is the DNA, which is the blueprint of everybody, what makes me, me and you, you. And there's some of those proteins really important. Do they do their job within that nucleus and they are set in the nucleus in a healthy motor neuron. But we know in motor neuron disease, as you'll see in the next slide, that instead of being in the nucleus, those, those proteins move out of the nucleus and we get these sticky clumps of protein outside the nucleus in the wrong place. So it's thought that perhaps this is a, one of the pathological conditions, these inclusions, if we can stop these inclusions being there, find the cause for that, we can keep the motor neurons healthy because they're not overloaded and they're not um, dying and degenerating as it happens in the disease. So in post-mortem, you can actually see these clumps of protein in about 97% of all people with MND. Um, motor neurons contain TDP43 mislocalized, so sticky clumps of a gene called a protein called TDP43. 2% of people are protein called SOD1, and 1% of people are protein called FUS. And um, so perhaps one of the ways to approach therapy is to stop these aggregates uh, occurring in the motor neurons. So I'll talk to you now about one of the therapies for this, which is the SOD1 gene therapy, a bit conscious that we're well past, we're good for time. So this is the Tefersen SOD1 gene therapy. And this was uh, run in the UK out of Sheffield by uh, Professor Dame, Dame Pamela Shaw and Chris McDermott, pitched on the bottom right through the company Biogen and Ionis. So this is a, um, a gene therapy to stop the production of a toxic protein. So the SOD1 gene change, if people have a mistake in their SOD1 gene, it produces a toxic protein which causes motor neuron disease in those people. So if we can stop that toxic SOD1 protein being made, we could potentially stop the disease in those people. So how do we get from genes to working pro work proteins? I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but our DNA contains instructions to make genes and genes make proteins. So the gene is photocopied in the machinery of the cell uh, to make RNA, which is like a photocopy of the particular instruction. And then the building blocks called amino acids are joined together in a very specific order. Um, and that's really important because the protein has to then fold to make a functional protein that works. So imagine the analogy, you go to Ikea, you come back with your chair, you follow the instructions, you stick it together, happy days, you've got a working functional chair. No problem, you need that, okay? Often what happens in uh, disease is that your proteins are made incorrectly. So you get the wrong instructions because there's an error in there, you carry on, put the thing together, and you've got a bit of a dangerous item that you don't need, which could cause a problem in the body. And this is what's thought to happen with this toxic SOD1 protein. So the mistake is in the gene. Here we've got the faulty gene with the red line. The fault is passed through the photocopy to the RNA. And then instead of the right amino acid being joined together to make this precise structure that folds, the wrong amino acid is put in place and the thing folds incorrectly and the toxic protein is produced. So for a gene therapy, ideally what you want to do is to stop that protein being produced by stopping one of these steps, either the RNA, the amino acid or the protein, or to correct the faulty gene in the first place. So the next slide, you'll see some arrows across there. Same principle, let's just stop the protein being made. What, what's actually happened in this SOD1 trial is that the RNA is actually destroyed by the um, 
by the medicine. So at that position where the arrow is, what's known as an antisense oligo actually binds to the specific RNA with the mistake in it, and the RNA is destroyed so that the protein is never made. And so the, the people don't have the toxic protein made anymore. And so this is what actually happened. I'll just show you some of the results from the clinical trial. So the clinical trial in this case is called VALA. And the blue line is six months after the start of the trial. The blue bar, sorry, the blue bar is six months after the start of the trial. So what you want to know is, do you get target engagement? Are you dropping the SOD1 protein level? So the dotted line in blue is the placebo group. So they didn't get any medicine. And the green line is the people who got the tofurcin medicine early on. And you'll see that their level of SOD1 dropped, which is good. It means that the medicine's hitting its target. So what happened after six months in the trial, everybody gets, gets given the medicine as part of the, part of the sort of incentive to join the trial. After six months, if you're on placebo, you'll also get given the medicine. You'll see now that the SOD1 level dropped in the placebo group, which are now given the drug as well. So we're getting target engagement in both groups. This is this is good news. Okay, so that's a biological response. Now I talked about a biomarker early on. Now we don't have a great biomarker for MND, but one of the best ones we have at the moment is something called neurofilament. Now motor neurons are built with this scaffolding really inside them, um, proteins called neurofilaments. So as the motor neurons die, these, these scaffolding break away and we can measure them in the bloodstream or the spinal fluid. And so they're really a marker of neuronal damage. So the more damage there is to the neurons, the more neurons are dying, the higher the level of neurofilament. That's the principle. We can actually measure the level of neurofilament. And in this trial, they did that. And you can see the same style of graph again, six months as a solid bar. In the placebo group, uh, no change in neurofilament, but the people who got the medicine in the trial, the neurofilament filament level dropped. So that suggests that actually neuronal damage is, is slowing down or, or being reduced by the, by the medication. And then after six months, everybody got given the, tr given the drug. And there we see the, um, the level of neurofilament starts to drop in the placebo group, which has now become the group taking the drug as well. So everybody's, everybody's uh, drug level starts to fall. So that's that's a really good sign, uh, and again, it's one of the first sort of biological indications of, of uh, an effective uh, result um, from a, a trial in MND for a gene therapy. So, what about respiratory function? So, actually, in the trial, it showed that there was an improvement. Uh, sorry, a, a slight improvement or a, a reduction in the loss of muscle strength, um, and also in respiratory function. So, the decline in respiratory function started to level out as well. So that's very promising. And then I talked early on about ALS FRS, which is this measure of function um, on this score of zero to 48. It's really a measure of disability. And the rate of decline of the disability started to slow in both groups when they were both given the medicine. So this implies actually that there is um, a, a response happening. But what, what's important and what I mentioned before about the early diagnosis is that in the early six months of the trial, the rate of disability was difficult to see a change, but going beyond six months in time, you then see that slowing. So actually, it takes time for people, the damage to be reduced and for people to recover or, or to reduce the slow, to reduce the rate of their decline. And so that's really important to understand. And it shows the earlier someone gets the medication, the better. So this drug's now been, been approved by the FDA in the USA um, based on the neurofilament marker and, and those results that I've shown you. So it's really promising. And people that have been on this trial um, have survived for a considerable amount of time. They've still got MND uh, and it's slowed their MND considerably. So it's really promising. One of the things that the company's now doing is to do pre-symptomatic testing. So to measure the level of neurofilament in everybody that has an SO, everybody that has a particular SOD1 mutation. So you could carry the gene but not have symptoms, but we'll measure your neurofilament levels. And if the if you're not getting symptoms, your neurofilament levels won't rise. You'll they'll be fine. But as soon as your neurofilament levels kick up, it indicates that MND is starting in you, and then you'll be given the medicine. So it's to see if a preventative treatment can be done from this therapy. So we await those results. So that's very promising. Survival um, improved considerably with this, as I say, it's improved, improved in, by the FDA in the US. And there are various issues ongoing with getting you know, moving towards approval um, in the UK and Europe. Uh, but again, that's another, another story.
I'll just round this up. So um, Pam, after doing the center, conducted more than 25 clinical trials. First trial in which patients have reported an improvement in their motor function. Never before have I had patients say I can do things today that I couldn't do for a few months a few months ago. So it's really optimistic for the for the whole community because it shows that actually MND is treatable if you get the right things in place at the right time. And it really offers hope that you know we can we can things can be repaired in people with MD potentially or or slowed down. So you know it's given everybody a massive boost to to kick on um and push forward with the next few next next round of of trials and medicines and work even harder. Um so yeah no issues with getting out of bed in the morning to get to get this kind of work done, which is fantastic. And just touched upon the 1% of people with the FUS mutation. This is another trial, exactly the same principle, removing the fuzz protein. This is a, a lady called JC. Um, and she was the first person to be given this um, fuzz antisense. Unfortunately, she um, died, but her some of her um, uh, measures improved after being given the medication. And she was part of a, a, a pair of twins who both had the fuzz mutation. Her sister died much uh, earlier than her before the medication was available. So this is a trial that's ongoing. And in a, in a, a meeting I went to a few months ago, there was a, um, a graph shown of the neurofilament levels dropping and the ALS FRS um, actually improving or kicking up, going up in, in one person out of 16 um, in this trial, this young girl. Um, or, it could be called a, a, a almost a reversal of her MND. Again, it's it's only one person out of sixteen, so you know you can't read too much into it. But it certainly uh, is a real sign of optimism that you know there's another potential therapy uh, we hope on the horizon. And there are I mentioned ninety seven percent of people have TDP forty three protein uh, mislocalized, so there are now gene therapies being developed uh, by different companies to target this TDP43, not necessarily TDP43 directly, but mechanisms that cause that TDP43 to aggregate, so further upstream. So there really is a, a, an amazing transition and change happening in, in the field. So, you know, hopeful that, hopeful that these things will happen. And as I mentioned earlier, there are, there are other clinical trials ongoing, uh, which are not just gene therapies, but other means of, of uh, treating MND, uh, we hope, in the future. So um, definitely never been a better time than there is now for MND. Um, yes, if you, this is really great, amazing resource. If you want to have more information, uh, more help, where to go for guidance, how to look after people with MD, all the things that I spoke about really badly, they're much better laid out um, here for you completely free. So please go to our website, click on the professionals page. So yeah, this is our front page profession professionals box on the top right. Just click on that and you'll get through to all of the resources and help for professionals uh, like yourselves. So um, there we go, various aspects of, of ways you can be helped. And also this video is fantastic. Um, tell you all about symptoms, um, talking from the perspective of people with MND as well. Really, really useful. Um, so please check that out. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, if you need any more information from myself or the research team, please get in touch. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you ever so much for your time. Brilliant. Nick, thank you so much. A whistle-stop tour, um, but really nice to finish on such a good point that it's never been better if you're going to have, have MND then. This is the time now. Um, have you got time to take two questions? I have, yes. Brilliant. So he do way, way at the very beginning. His question was basically, do we get that clinical diagnosis right in a timely manner? Uh, yeah, I'd say we, yeah, it could certainly be better. I mean, I hear stories all the time from people um, about um, being sent to, you know, get their back checked out or their ankle checked out. Um, yeah, it's just so difficult to do because it's um, it's mimicked by so many things. So, yeah, it's definitely not perfect. Uh, I'm I'm not a neurologist and I don't diagnose people. So, I you know I've I've chatted to neurologists and I know I hear how incredibly difficult and emotive it is to do that diagnosis as well. Um, yeah. Okay, and um, Susantha is asking. Has there been a trend in increase of incidence of MND post COVID pandemic? Yeah, noticed? interesting question. So actually, um, there was some a few studies done on that, and there hasn't been any 
thing said that there's an increase in numbers you know there was there's always talk about vaccines and and various other things may have a have an effect not by me by i mean like conspiracy theorist ideas um and they, there hasn't been any evidence of an increase in MD post pandemic for any any known reasons there has been an increase in the number of people going to see neurologists with MD because people weren't seen during during the pandemic so a lot of a lot of people haven't been diagnosed as early as they would have been if that if that makes sense because they haven't been to the doctors or they've just they've just lived with something um yeah so again that's yes brilliant nick thank you sir so very much for your time this afternoon i'll close um i'll close the uh first session off now thank you very much